we are live. Good day, everyone, and welcome at the Meticulous Moments podcast, where we facilitate community upliftment through leadership development. And today we have the wonderful privilege of spending time with the amazing Michelle Lopez Cardozo. I'm going to read his bio. He's here live with me in the green room, and after which I'm going to bring him on screen. So let's let's learn a little bit more about Michelle. Michelle Abia Lopez Cardozo, 1972, is known for his roles in Game of Thrones and Vikings. Michelle was born in a small town called Laren in North Holland. His parents are Jacques Lopez Cardozo, who is a dentist, and Anna Marie van Leeuwen. He has two younger siblings, Eva and Sharon Lopez Cardozo. Michelle is an international sword master, a painter of the fine arts, musician, coach, and entrepreneur. As a young kid, he was blessed and cursed with many talents. For his education, he had to choose between art school or conservatorium. Michel ended up studying art at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in The Hague. He made his living as an artist and jazz musician, drums and guitar. His hobby was historical fencing, which over the years became his new profession. In 2002, he founded his historical fencing club, Amek, which he turned into a company, Hema, Events and Film, and he introduced Hema, Historical European Martial Arts in the Netherlands, which led to a rich and thriving subculture consisting of many Hema clubs scattered throughout the Netherlands. In the Hema scene, he is considered one of the top promoters of this ancient art and an authority on 15th century German fighting arts. He teaches in over 22 countries worldwide under the name Cardozo Sword Sport and initiated and co-founded the HEFAC, the first coalition uniting all existing HEMA clubs in the lowlands, which led to official unions for this new martial art. In 2008, Michel was knighted in Holland for his contribution to the reconstruction of the historical European martial heritage in the lowlands and was elevated to the Dutch Hall of Fame for Martial Arts in 2014. Winning three times the international championships for stage combat in Italy and many gold medals during his career as a HEMA tournament fighter. That opened the door for him to the movie industry, where he was discovered by director Stefano Miller, who gave him his first role as Wilhelm in the motion picture Richard the Lionheart Rebellion. In this movie, Michel plays plays a ruthless killer knight and the right hand of Henry IV. The first role stirred Michel's interest in acting and led to further roles in the hit series Game of Thrones, Vikings and many more. Apart from acting and Hema, Michel does motion capture for computer games and organizes workshops and demonstrations for company events. He likes to ride horses, shoot bow and arrow, throw knives and swing swords. Michel is a true knight in heart and soul. His wish and goal are to become the first Dutch action hero and bring authentic historical fencing back to the silver screen, combining his acting talent and his exceptional fighting skill to promote HEMA worldwide. Let's welcome our special guest here at Meticulous. Hi. Welkom, Michel. Hoe gaat het met jou vandaag? Met mij gaat het goed. <laughs> ja, we kunnen elkaar dus gewoon verstaan. Dat is echt maar uh, dus, Ja, het is wonderlijk om jou hier te hebben. Hoe gaat het daar? Is het, wat is die weer vandaag bij jullie? Uh, het weer hier is op zich wel goed, eigenlijk. En, uh, het is altijd een beetje wat wij noemen wispelturig. Hm? Wispelturig, maar, ja. Ja, wispelturig. Ze zeggen altijd van als je het weer niet bevalt in Holland, dan moet je gewoon even tien minuten wachten. Dan krijg je vanzelf weer een ander weer. Maar nu is het goed. Dus oh, het, is, het, zonne, het zonnetje schijnt. Je kan in je t-shirt naar buiten. En dat is wel uh, zeldzaam hier. Ach, het is lekker. Zolang je zon niet schijnt en uh, je weet dat een lekker dag buiten is. Ik wil het voor je zeggen. Dank je, Michel, dat je hier samen met ons is vandaag. Het is een groot eer om op jou hier zo bij ja, met die kille te zijn. Ja, Wonderful, Welcome wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Let's let's get into who is Michelle because I know the audience want to learn more about you. You are busy. You you're so skilled and talented in so many areas. Tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Well, the the introduction was already uh, well, kind of covered it all. We should just stop the the interview here. That, yeah, that's basically sums up about everything. But yeah, about me. Yeah, I'm a guy. I live in Harlem, and uh, uh, I always uh, I always knew that I I was not I was not born for for like uh, the the standard boring life, you know. So as a young kid. I decided already that uh, that yeah I I just want to do as many cool things as I can in the time that that I can spend here on on this planet. So and I remember that when I was in class, that a teacher uh, asked me, "From what do you want to become when you are older?" And I yeah. said, uh, "I think you mean what I want." To do from nine till eight but what i want to become would be uh yeah a, a wise man if if possible and i was eight so i said a wise man and and hopefully a, a, a happy one you know that is yeah. kind of nice also to other people and that i'm not gonna turn into some some asshole when i'm uh, i'm older you know and yeah. but i said what i'm going to do or become what you say that is doing i said i have no idea so uh, yeah, becoming and doing are two different things. So yeah, you cannot become your profession. You know, it's just something that you do. And uh, so, and I, I told uh, this uh, this teacher back then that uh, for sure that I was not gonna stare out a window like I was doing now in class, being bored, and yeah. uh, just uh, watching the birds come by. You know, I said I have no idea what I'm gonna do, but I'm not gonna spend my time in an office. That is for sure. And I also don't want to come out of my bed too early. I also told her that when I was eight. <laughs> now I still get up pretty early, but if I don't want to, I don't have to. Good. That's amazing. And you know, I see I see uh, you being very straightforward even at the age of eight. And you know, honestly, all the way through, you had your opinion already that time. That's wonderful that you were established in those foundational beliefs when you were young already. So I believe that, you know, we follow our hearts and our passions and life is about happiness and about feeling that fulfillment. So, yes, we, we, the, what we do and what we become are different things. I agree with you. And uh, I want to ask you, you had a choice. We go through many t uh, times in our lives where we are at a crossroads, where we have to make a choice. You, you had a choice to make at a certain point in your life about, you know, which direction you, was, you were going to take. And I believe that you pursued the art. What helped you, the arts, what helped you to make that decision? Uh, well, it, it already helped that I went to the conservatorium and uh, they, uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't let me in. So the alternative was art school. And uh, technically, I was I was good. They said uh, you 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 technically you can you're very good. But I was I did audition as a drummer, but my solfege. So basically, you know the general uh, knowledge about uh, theoretical music. Yes. So hearing intervals and scales and stuff as a drummer, yeah, you are pretty much handicapped with that with that stuff. So that requires really you know, uh, a lot of studying and that I didn't do. And uh, yeah, and only later on, actually, I started uh, playing guitar. So yeah, I was about to come back next year to do audition, at least for the theoretical part, because the, the technical part was fine. Yeah. And uh, but then I was already hired in the art school. So I, I did that. But education is in the end, not that important. Important. I mean, I hope I don't kick too many people in the shin, but let's say that all the people that I know, uh, talented or let's say successful uh, musicians and even successful artists, uh, most of them didn't even finish their uh, education, you know, and in the end, whatever, even if you want to be an entrepreneur or uh, doing business, you know, what do you what do you need? You need papers. Yeah. From if you want to have a uh, office job from yeah. Yes. From eight to five, you need you need papers, and uh, and uh, to put something on your resume to have a job interview. But if you're all by yourself and you have to you have this whole planet to your disposal, and uh, yeah, a chance of possibility to do something, 
that uh, you are passionate about and there are there are no boundaries and certainly not some mumbo jumbo on a piece of paper is going to prevent you from doing something or not having it it's not going to prevent you from doing something uh, interesting yeah. with your life not saying that nine to five uh, job is not interesting because if that is your thing then it's totally fine but it was not yes. my absolutely yeah you you phrased that uh, very well the way you articulated that was uh, very good that's true there is a place of course for nine to five jobs and there are people that are happy and fulfilled in those i just believe that entrepreneurs and many times musicians like you've mentioned we don't fit into that mold we don't fit into that box and that's fine no, because difficult. we have something else to give the world yeah but you have to be in a sense very very uh, talented and dedicated also to do certain uh, certain jobs you know uh, yeah. I could not do it. Uh, it's just basically it. And I also tried. I also tried, but it just doesn't work. I just, uh, when I was younger, I also uh, tried just the holiday jobs as a kid, you know, to make extra money and stuff. And uh, that even didn't really work, you know. I had to get, got fired or I was working somewhere and then they were playing every time the same music, you know, and that just drive, drove me bonkers, you know, as a musician. And uh, yeah. every time, uh, you know, and I would work mostly with Christmas, you get all the Christmas jingles and my brain would just fry. And I would say, OK, <laughs> you know, you guys have to switch the CD, just put some other music on or I'm gone, you know. So and then they said, oh, this is how this is just what it is. And I said, OK, you, oh, yeah, I'm off. See you later. That's a little <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, yeah. And then I realized also, you know, I can take orders from people also yeah. if they are more skilled than me then oh, i have no problem then i become the soldier and somebody else can yeah. become the general yes but if you have but yeah but if you have more knowledge about something uh or you figure things out fast and, and then yeah and more people of course have that issue then it's difficult yes. to deal with authorities that are n not that capable <laughs> that's good yeah that you know that speaks to your personality and your skill level, of course, and that's not a, it, it just means that you have a strong personality. And I think we all get yeah. uh, to the place where we have to know when to lead and when to follow. So the point you made is exceptional. I haven't spoken about that on meticulous with anyone before. So thank you for mentioning that. That's a good point in some settings. In some settings we follow and in some settings we lead and that's that's not a bad thing so uh thank you for for mentioning that so uh, i wanted to ask you you know you are a, a musician and mm -hmm. it doesn't take a theoretical um uh, paperwork to make you a good musician i know many people that sit in they, they can hear a tune they can hear a song they can sit in front of that piano and they can just play it or take the guitar pick it up and just play that song and that's another type of a talent, you know. It's just as no, absolutely, important. yeah. yeah so and that theoretical, you know, that was uh, that was never never a thing, you know, in in, in the old days, you know, not even uh, yeah. I mean, let's say music has been made longer than there was yeah. theoretical knowledge about it, you know. <laughs> and you have people that uh, can just only work from uh, let's say read notes, and yes. are very technically skilled. And some people can't read notes, but they can improvise and just do everything by heart and by feeling. But that is also, I think, in martial arts, I think the, the, the concept between the neocortex, so the big brain, and also the smaller, the smaller brain, the cerebellum. Because in the end, you have, as a human being, you have two drives. And uh, from at least what I've been told is that the cerebellum, your small brain can do 10 million kilobytes a second as a processor and your big brain can only do six to eight kilobytes so it's like a slow grinder but wow. uh yeah some people work a lot from their cerebellum which is a lot of uh, there's the planning going yes. and strategy and you know stuff you have to think through and your cerebellum is all your your stored reflex is more like your uh, all the routines you already did before but also your gut feeling you know like the in the moment what the German fencing theory calls Indes, that is like Indes. in the moment. It's like wow. India, November, Delta, Echo, 
Sierra Indes. That's a word that does not exist in German anymore, but that was a it's a cool terminology in, in, in fencing, but it counts for a whole life, you know, being in the moment. So if you improvise, you know, those people work more, you know, from their gut. And if you yeah. read, you're more from your from your head. That's it. That's it. And uh, you know, adaptability forms part of that. Being able to adapt quickly to a situation. And I think, uh, you know, when, when you really just go with the flow, that's a good thing. I've, I've mentioned uh, many times that I don't control the waves, I ride them. Because I, I realize that we live in a different world now. And we have mm -hmm. to be adaptable, especially after COVID. So it's good that we work on those skills where we can, you know, really just be in any setting and improvise and still have a successful result. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, yeah. I think uh, the human being itself could be maybe wrong, but I think it's one of the more, more uh, adaptable organisms in a sense because we can manage, we can manage, uh, and we can manage a lot. So, uh, and that is, uh, I think, also, uh, yeah, hopefully, the, at least one of the success factors for the human beings. Although we have many faults and we're not uh, very hospitable to our own habitat, but uh, yeah. That's, uh, but yeah, we have uh, human beings are interesting. It's like uh, it's like so so just one big contradiction of yeah. amazing stuff that we can create and the harm we can inflict on others is just yeah, it's total insanity actually if you think about it. That's true. That is a paradox. That is actually very interesting. Om te zien hoe ons, ons so, uh, die, die talent het om zoveel so goed te doen, maar toch gebruik ons die kennis en ons breek ons wereld af. En je weet, die, die, die mensdom is rechtig nie baie goed vir mekaar. Dat is baie dinge in die wereld. So, I agree with you completely. And we should, we should really put focus on that. Um, coming back to your music, do you play electric guitar or acoustic? Uh, Acoustic. <laughs> yes. And do you practice still, or how does that work with your schedule? Because I know you're very busy with the movie industry and the yeah, software. well, well, I, I teach a lot, so that is what I do: teaching, coaching, and then I have my uh, my movie stuff also on the side. But mostly, I'm just uh, teaching historical fencing, which I still enjoy uh, a lot. So. Uh, yeah, but I try to uh, yeah do uh, my freelance gigs basically, and those are really mellow gigs. You know, I just go somewhere and then two guitars, and then we play like a jazz, a Spanish, and like a combo of uh, different stuff and our own pieces that we wrote. And then uh, yeah, that's uh, just uh, I just do now just small small gigs that I I enjoy. So I keep practicing basically yeah. my skills so they say okay cool let's have the viking guy over and uh, to play uh, in the corner of a restaurant you know or whatever then i actually am completely fine with it so oh, wow. uh, i enjoy that i also uh, and we're because we're yeah we play with my guitar duo uh yeah we're not gonna have like a huge uh, huge amount of people but we're just you know small small gigs that's what i still do but i also enjoy that much more because i used to yeah. do a little bit more bigger stuff when i was younger but for now you know when it's a little bit more intimate just two classic guitarists it, it's uh oh, it's kind of nice yeah. i keep my a uh, little bit my skills then up but i broke my uh, my finger so my pinky is now a little bit uh, <laughs> but <laughs> you don't use your pinky that much with your right hand so uh, oh, good. <laughs> oh you yeah. play left yeah yeah you you do the strumming with the right hand so how's the pinky feeling i remember when we had the virtual coffee you'd been through a tournament tell us about the tournament because it was your pinky and i think your knee yeah i decided to fight again uh i got an invitation and uh i have not been uh practicing at least for tournaments that's a specific specific oh. uh, specific thing and uh but normally i go in cold and just see how things go because i keep myself in shape but it, it was really already a while back and uh and these were all the yeah a lot of champions basically like world champions that were there so it was like a special thing 
uh, in Greece. So I went there and I trained my knees especially very hard. So everything was kind of a top shape. And then, uh, yeah, I was fighting Federico Dolollio. He's an Italian uh, friend of mine, a very good fighter. And uh, yeah, I hit him in the head. I, 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 I turned back, so basically to cover the after blow, because yeah, when you hit somebody, you might still get the, the strike back. Yeah. And uh, he nipped me in my finger. So shriek, that was the finger. So yeah, I broke, uh, broke in two, but I was like three weeks. Uh, I was still doing all my stuff. And then I saw my finger just getting worse and worse. And uh, so then I decided maybe I should go to the hospital. And then they said, okay, yeah, I got to have surgery immediately. But also I screwed up my knee and they also have to put the pins in. So in the screws and then I have to take it out also. So uh, one tournament and then I'm three operations down the road. So uh, it's kind of messing up my schedule and everything. So I also decided that maybe I should not uh, call it really quits now with my, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, professional uh, tournament career because yeah. it, I'm I, I'm 50 and uh, yeah, yeah it has no use you know when you okay, my, my mind still wants to but uh, yeah. and the body still goes pretty okay but up to yeah. a certain moment and then it says uh, check out <laughs> and then the uh, laptop is out <laughs> Oh my goodness, that was, that's a good uh, description that you gave there. And I just want to say to the audience, uh, you know, Michelle, that is full contact. This is full contact sword fighting. This is not just... Yeah, yeah, no, this is this is kick-ass. Uh, this is with steel weapons, uh, deal, relatively deal. very light gear. So you have a fencing mask, you have a gorget for your throat, um, you have elbow protection, and you have special gloves that work very efficiently uh and then uh, knee protection groin protection shin protection oh. and uh yeah mostly they have also a jacket that can resist uh like 350 newton uh impact uh, for the stabs so in case the sword breaks uh that uh, that used to be a problem with fencing in the old days people would die because uh, and you have like a small car antenna, basically, epe, and you stab and it breaks off because of metal fatigue. And then yeah. breaks off in a point and the last bit will go through the mask and then basically press the metal wires to the side and yeah. penetrate uh, an eye or whatever. So uh, yeah, we have special jackets for that. But I was not wearing that in that tournament. So I was just wearing a very simple uh, motocross uh, uh, pets basically and a garment yeah. and then uh, a hoodie over it and that's it because i like oh. it you know the lighter the better so when i get hit it hurts and that keeps me awake so that's but yeah good. you turn yeah but you you are really completely black i mean i didn't send you any pictures of that but you end up just you look like a zebra so you get all these not blue spots not green or yellow it is black spots it's just yeah. black so uh yeah it's uh, it's uh, the the impact of a sword depending on how somebody hits but they can reach easily three 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 and a half thousand kilos uh, square oh. centimeter impact so it's it's a lot of power that you can create yeah that that's that's tough and uh, you mentioned about the pain you know it keeps you awake it made me think of something that we always hear in our dojo and they, they always tell us pain is the best teacher it does make you vigilant and you know it, it helps you to learn uh you know certain skills not to make the same mistakes or to get into the same situation oh, yeah. so, absolutely yeah. yeah yeah no pain no gain <laughs> that's it or no that's train it. no pain and no pain no gain so that's yeah. it yeah <laughs> Oh yeah. my God, I didn't know that it was uh, that much of a force that, that it uh, emits. Yeah, the sword fighting goes, uh, yeah, first of all, most people have not even heard of it. And I'm trying actually to see if I can promote it more internationally during the tournaments because I think it's, it's bloody cool, you know, you see two sword fights going in the ring. I mean, the, the and kicking the shit out of each other. But uh, the Russians, they had something like that, you know, like M1, but that was just in armor where you had like, maybe you've seen that, 
like uh, and you also have battle of the nations where people go in full armor and just bashing at each other and that is not what we do i mean we have uh in the medieval times you had three disciplines to fight you had harnish fechten which is basically an armor you had ross fechten which was on a horse and blows fechten which means naked fighting what means without armor so you would be either bare chested a linen shirt or uh, a, a du woolen doublé or but and, and a woolen pants and some leather shoes but the difference is between without armor and armor in medieval uh, times is that when you were fighting without armor well let's say like this if you have no armor and you're yeah. fighting somebody in armor then you would fight with one hand on the on the sword basically so like this so this is the grip this is the, yeah. the middle and uh, you use basically as a spear and the oh. openings are like in the armpit the visor genitals and inside hand but that's oh. only what you have so you use your, your sword as a, as a spear because it has no use to cut because you have an armor it has no use yeah. to strike i mean if mm -hmm. you can eat a hamburger while five guys are going full at you with swords and hammers in armor it doesn't really matter you can just eat your hamburger so the the, the that illusion what you see in movies is not completely entirely correct but if you would have armor and you would fight somebody without armor you would hold yeah. your sword let's say your long sword two hands on the grip and mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want because the person has no armor so you can perform the what we call the three miracles mm. which is basically cutting stabbing and slicing and two of them you can't do basically if you are uh, in uh, uh, if you're in armor yeah people can only stab you but you put the hand on the grip halfway uh, the blade sorry so you have more control over the over the point oh. and, uh, so there's different styles of fighting in medieval times and we yeah. can on what we do uh, so backtracking is that the battle of the nations and also m1 that the russians did like uh it's wow. like uh, two, two guys in the ring or a bunch of guys in the ring uh in armor just bashing at each other uh we do blows fechten and we That's do good. really the historical uh mm -hmm. techniques from the manuscript so we actually mm -hmm. fight and fence like they did in medieval times and not like some improvised interpretation of you know yeah. you grab a sword and you just try to bash somebody in the in the helmet because those let's say you, yeah. you know battle of the nations you've seen that or not you know what i mean or no i haven't seen it before okay, i've well, heard it's, it's a it's a it's, it's pretty popular but basically in medieval times that would not happen you don't have yeah. uh, let's say eight knights in armor just hacking away at each other they would immediately grab the sword as a spear try to stab the other guy and yeah. make no strikes or maybe turn their sword so you use the cross guard as a hammer oh. to get in the neck oh. and then you would just jump on somebody try to throw him with sort of equivalent wrestling let's say judo techniques for those that uh, yeah. don't do uh, ringen or german german uh, yeah. fencing, uh martial uh, terminology so basically unarmored fighting take them to the ground and you finish it off with a dagger so that is armored fighting and unarmored fighting everything is uh target so yeah. uh, that's what we do and that's also I, I like it more because it's more elegant and it's mm. really like medieval uh, yeah. uh knights would fight because in yeah. medieval times they could also fight in armor but a lot of these uh, duels between knights were fought without armor and they left their armor at home because you were more exposed and more vulnerable oh and you can then also say okay okay we do a light fight so as soon as we draw blood or you know somebody's seriously oh. injured you know then we stop the fight oh. and if we fight in armor yeah mostly uh, yeah you go and wrestle to the ground and then yeah. Uh, yeah you can only get in there with a with a dagger and then it's only yeah then it's uh, never ends well <laughs> no <laughs> so uh, this yeah 
or submission of course for tournaments they did that also submission yeah submission yeah tapping up what's the difference between cutting and slicing because you mentioned stabbing cutting and slicing what's the difference a cut is a uh, is a strike so let's um, say uh, so striking and cutting is the same okay. so maybe i should say striking stabbing and slicing but you oh, don't say striking okay. you say cutting with a sword so cutting is basically when you get an initial attack and it's mm -hmm. basically a, a cut with a rotation of the blade and oh. slicing is once you make let's say contact with the weapon let's say with somebody and this yes. person changes around to strike from the other side and you oh. for instance follow while not really making a strike but pushing the hands down and trying to really cut you know like oh. you're or you're you're uh, cutting a piece of bread which yeah. is, a different, uh, is a different mechanic oh interesting very very interesting now talking about movies because we read your bio and we heard where your your interest uh, developed and your love for movie making developed mm -hmm. we also read about game of thrones we read about vikings tell us more about these series that you were a part of uh well, Game of Thrones was uh, was a very small part. I'm just very happy and lucky I was even able to make it into that show. And also having a scene with Peter Dinklage and Conleth Hill, which was, of course, the two main characters. Because, yeah, you could also have a role in, in, the, in the series and never meet those guys because there were also uh, different locations and studios. But I actually get to meet them and... Uh, yeah uh and hang out with them and that that was that was really 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 cool and uh it was also just by sheer luck that i in the in the end uh got got on board of, of game of thrones yeah. i mean and it was also luck that i the first gig that i did with stefano mila because uh yeah all these stories are just a, a little bit uh out of the out of the ordinary but you want me to tell first how I got into the movie business? Yes, please. Okay, so let's, <laughs> let's do that. So, so first of all, it started with with a uh, with with a bet basically with my uh, with my students. Well, not okay. So Stefano Mila was first. So let's okay. So Stefano Mila, I'm fighting in Italy, and uh, we had a tournament there. Yeah. And Stefano Mila was a really okay, famous in italian actor that uh, sorry, a director that now went to la and uh, he saw me fight and my friends and he invited me for his uh, screening for his new movie so and that was going to be in a church and uh, so we said okay, okay. we uh, we come and join and uh, we go uh, and uh, there we go, the movie i hear some talking all right cool so uh so we went to his movie screening after our tournament and we went with five guys but we are all very tired and he started the movie the sound was of course it's a church so it was a good uh, surround oh, sound and stuff nice. and but uh, my buddy uh, he fell asleep so he started snoring very loudly and we're trying to kick him to stay awake because he was everybody was looking at him annoyed <laughs> and uh, and he was like <laughs> and but then instead of him waking up uh, another friend of mine also falls asleep so we suddenly have this stereo canon kind of uh, <clears throat> horrible noise like the roof is coming down and in the end i am completely ashamed and i'm like shit you know this is this is not good and everybody's looking at uh, at me and my buddy was still awake uh annoyed and the other guy said well they didn't give a rat's rump because they were already asleep <laughs> and then the worst part is that suddenly i heard clapping and i woke up and i and yeah and i i guess we're all in a horrible position in those chairs and actually what we heard later on is that we're like with five guys and we were all snoring and completely screwed up this screening and everybody was just so annoyed but yeah these big dudes sitting there i mean nobody's gonna do anything so and then of course uh, stefano he came walking up to us with his very very sour face and he went like hmm. 
did you uh, enjoy my movie? And uh, I said, ah, you're the director, right? Yeah, yeah, you invited me to come to the screening. I said, so, uh, yeah, well, the question, yeah. Uh, you want to have an honest answer or you want to have a polite answer because I'm Dutch? And he said, uh, give me uh, the honest answer. So I said, well, man, your movie sucked ass. That's what I said. When I was younger. I, was, uh, I said, your movie sucked ass. And he said, what? He was telling you honestly, man, your movie sucked ass. The sword fighting was was a nightmare. And yeah. he said, okay, you think you can do better? And I said, yeah, man, fuck yeah, I can do better. And he said, okay, you're going to be on my next movie. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. <laughs> wow. You know, you've always been straightforward since you were young, even with your teacher and then later on with with him. And, you know, that was a good thing. It opened many doors for you. So what was his reaction when you Yeah, said, well, he said, you're going to be on a new movie. And uh, and he kept his word. And then I was going to do the fight geography wow. and uh, only. And then he, uh, in the end... Uh, asked me to say a couple of lines and in the end the, the uh, antagonist was that he had in mind he cancelled him and I suddenly got a role and I got to act in that movie wow. so uh, yeah that's basically how that went uh, went down so I started from nothing and then ended up doing that movie and that was my first acting experience and I still remember the first scene that we did I had to play this this ruthless killer with no uh, no emotion, and my heart was just pounding, you know, with the cameras and on set, you know. And I had no acting experience, but of course yeah. I've been in, in large audiences and stuff like that. But yeah, this was a completely new turf. So, yeah. but you did it. But, yeah, but the sword fighting and uh, you know and all my other trainings they they kind of helped me get through it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and that was basically the start, but also sort of the end because I just did it as a one time go. And later on, this came up and uh, years later, and we I talked about to my students about Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sylvester Stallone, how they started, you know, and for me, like the 80s role models, you know, because yeah. I'm an old fart. And uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because I think the young people, that probably you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, or that, that wrinkly old guy that you see coming by on Facebook once in a while. <laughs> well, he was a legend, ladies and gentlemen. He was. And he still is. Yes. But anyway, but it's they're, they're legends, in my opinion, because they started with nothing, you know, and that is so amazing. Those those are inspiring stories. Those, uh, you know, not not the, the rich kids that already started with something, you know, but those that yeah. have nothing, you know. And uh, yeah, and they said, okay, well, you know, because I do uh, lectures about mindset and, you know, Fantastic. getting it done and stuff like that. And uh, and my students basically said it was bullshit. They said that mm -hmm. my lectures were bullshit. And I said, why do you think my lectures are bullshit? Because they said, you know, that whole thing, you know, about visualization and getting stuff done. And, you know, if everybody would just be able to, visualize whatever you want to be then everybody was would be doing you know uh, then everybody would be uh you know or a famous musician or an artist or whatever or an actor and i said well no because not everybody you know ha has those tools and yes. uh, and so those people also really fought hard for it and they said no they just got lucky and I said, well, you know, I've known many examples that had to fight really, really hard against all odds and just yeah. perseverance and just kept going. And I said, well, okay, if you uh, if you want to uh, you want to convince us that your uh, lecture uh, stuff is not bullshit, then prove it. Yeah. When I said, well, okay, I'm supposed to prove it, and said, okay, well, we'll make a bet. So uh, we're gonna think of something for you to achieve still, and mm -hmm. if you're able to pull it off. Then we believe your mindset uh, uh, bullshit is not bullshit. <laughs> I said it's okay, cool. So then a week later they came to me and they said, "Well, you did some part in a movie like a long time ago," and I said, "Yeah, yeah, 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 yeah." He said, "Well, that's a good thing, you know. Well, like, why not become a, really become an actor?" 
and uh, I, said, and I said, why don't you think I can be an actor? Because you know, I did already uh, uh, that, that small thing so with Stefan Miller back a long time ago, and that was for me a one-time thing. And uh, yeah. I was just busy with my club, a bit sword fighting, and so many other things. And they said, uh, because well, you actually cannot act. You don't have an agent. And uh, you're also now too old to start a really an acting career. And I said, okay, well, you might have a point, but uh, you know, uh, let's see, uh, let's see if you, if your point is valid. And I said, okay, let me think about it. And then I came back next week, and then I said, okay, mm -hmm. let's make the bet. You know, I said, uh, in uh, two years, I will be in either Game of Thrones or Vikings or Star Wars, because they said that I had to at least get a role in really something that they knew and something that yeah. was, you know, like, and, uh, and those were, of course, impossible titles, because everybody wants to play in those. Uh, so I said uh, Game of Thrones and Vikings and uh, Star Wars. And I bet for 10 bucks with 150 students. So that was good money, or I just lose my... Uh, my uh, my credibility for my lectures and in the end they never paid me because it took me two months uh sorry two years and three months so i was three uh, months over time but i scored two out of three so that was okay wow. and then actually it ignited my uh sort of passion and started thinking yes. okay maybe i should get acting classes and maybe get a little bit because i i started to really enjoy it you know yeah so uh, and that's kind of how 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 it uh, came to be. So acting by a default or chance, so something like that. Fantastic, fantastic. That's kind of poetic in a sense. And you know, you got into Game of Thrones and Vikings, which is phenomenal. And uh, I wanted to ask you about Vikings. What was your part? What role did you play in Vikings uh, for the audience? And what was your favorite part about playing that role? Oh, in Vikings, uh, yeah, in Game of Thrones, it was I played a brothel, brothel guard. I had text, and that was uh, my scene where I rob. Uh, I just backtracking to Game of Thrones, where I yeah. get to rob uh, Peter Dinklage's head, and I said, uh, "It's good luck to rob a dwarf's head." Yeah, and the stuff that that was the, the the top scene, and where he says, "Was even better luck to suck a dwarf's peep," you know, like. And that was a, that was a, that was a funny one because uh, uh, that was a, it was a funny funny scene, and uh, but yeah, the big one of course was then Vikings, and there I played King Hakon in season six. So then I'm uh, and I really tried really hard to get on board of that show, which was also yeah. very very hard, I'm and sure. took me in the end four auditions to actually finally because every time another season passed by, and I wanted to be sort of on that uh, on that show you know yeah and uh yeah they're gonna make six i knew that it's gonna be five or six seasons so in the end it was just really that i still made it exactly in the last show and then also yeah, like a king and uh vikings valhalla is basically based on my character in the movie so in the end of it, it was yeah it was a cool part good experience there i'm sure you had a lot of fun on set as well yeah, I asked, always lovely people. Yeah, do you have funny moments as well? I asked Sylvia Simak this question once. Uh, are there funny moments on set, you know, behind the scenes, or do you do you is it serious or what is it like when you when you're shooting? No, it's always uh, it's always it's always it depends a little bit on the production. So Game of Thrones was really stressy. So I've seen uh, very talented and experienced actors yeah. collapsing and being brought back with a taxi to their hotel and the shoot was delayed oh. uh, yeah to be uh, so there there, there was there, yeah i think they were a little bit behind time so that was a little bit more more stressful yeah i think for everybody also for the light department for everybody but yeah and yeah. this is really my experience when i was on set and uh, vikings was really relaxed so the opposite seemed to be like a very smooth smooth a machine where everybody's really laid back so when we're not shooting we actually uh, had a good time to chill and and relax that's good that's very interesting uh thank you that you did with us and uh, you also do coaching and you're also an entrepreneur 
So I want you to elaborate, you know, on your coaching. What coaching do you do? You know, what what is your focus there? And then your entrepreneurship. Well, you know, I just try to, uh, the entrepreneur thing is also, of course, in the end, all my hobbies and trying to monetize uh, the, these things. So in the end, yeah, I, I combine stuff. But I also do, I also have some hobbies where I'm now uh, uh, trying to monetize because I like RPGs, for instance. I'm like a hardcore role player, you know, like very nerdy. And I picked it up very late in life. So like, tabletop RPGs, you know, with, with friends, yeah. like uh, you have now like critical role and some, you know, like the whole Dungeons Dragons kind of thing. But I wrote my own system. So I'm bu busy oh. with that now, for instance, launching that because it's also sort of a sort of a, yeah, a late, late, um, yeah, let's say a dream, but like mm -hmm. a kid's dream, you know what I mean? Like a kid, I'm an adult, but it's like a kid's dream, you know, oh, to have wow. my own game out, you know, and That's stuff, cute. stuff like that. So I'm working on my own wine and th things like, uh, you know, stuff that, yeah. uh, that I have a passion about, you know, yes. so I like to do just, uh, funny, funny stuff. But even if my, if my hobby, you know, like sitting with friends and having a, drinking a wine and rolling some dice, you know, yeah. that also even want to see, you know, I, I'm like, for instance, now even uh, I'm a dungeon master, you know, so people hire me to do a session on the, on the table. And wow. uh, so even that, but of course, that's not big money, but it's the, the, the whole concept is, and also not about getting paid because you do it for fun, but it's just cool that yes. people ask you to just, to a session you know okay. it can be with strangers that only know you you know and uh, from hearsay and then uh, i take my stuff and then i basically uh, create a whole evening with an adventure that they can play and part yeah. it's cool because it's very uh, strategic and i am a, yeah i have a pretty much military mindset and also had a lot of training in that department so i wrote a system even for me yeah. it's called real and uh, that is more about uh, from a fencing more realistic perspective so it's a fantasy setting but it's uh, it's uh, it's like as real as it can be you know from a mindset perspective and from a military perspective and you can act in rpgs so back to the uh, entrepreneur stuff so i i try to basically with all my hobbies see if i can expand them in uh, in the entrepreneur uh, Stuff. Wonderful. So the rest I do, of course. So, so uh, you know, uh, crypto, being uh, the stuff, you know, like uh, yes. there's some, many things that many things that I do. I'm busy in Mexico with a project, but uh, you know, it's yeah, uh, yeah. Those are all side uh, side things. Mm. You said something else. It, He's an entrepreneur. Uh, what else did you say? Uh, uh, yeah, the entrepreneurship and the coaching. Uh, uh, the coaching. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah, and the coaching, of course, is is. Uh, a little bit the same same story yeah so, uh, and i'm trying now to get more also in the uh let's say uh the bigger um uh, what is the name for that in english uh well bigger the bigger companies you know like coaching on the work floor and yeah. uh and i do now a lot of one-on-one -on -one coaching oh, but good. also i'm interested really in the group dynamics and using medieval yeah. philosophy and terminologies yeah. Uh, about the mindset, how, how to get things done, and also to get how, how to get a healthy uh, healthy mindset, basically, mm -hmm. and also how to work together, you know, more efficiently yes. uh, when yes. people are working in a group, mm -hmm. and help people with that. So. Yeah, combining all those strings, you know, to make to make the goal real a realization. I I realized today when we were discussing the time. Uh, I, I saw the military, uh, when you sent 1,400 hours, that's military terminology, isn't it? I know 1,400 hours, so I've also got friends in the military, they they give those did, times through, so yeah. Did, did I send it? Yeah, you said 1,400, so I was like, military background. <laughs> oh, then that's <laughs> automatic. Yeah, yeah so that's right. really interesting that your military background and you also you know you're not you, you you're so fluent in so many areas you do acting you're an artist you're a musician and you're a coach well, and entrepreneur. yeah but uh, i'm not a military uh, let's say uh, not the standard military guy <laughs> i did a lot of training but that's yeah. a different different story 
so yeah, I basically have a lot of a lot of uh, friends that uh, spec ops, special forces guys, and yeah. Uh, yeah since I was younger, uh, I have been training a lot, lot with with these guys, and uh, yeah, and uh, some of them are like really, you know, like. Uh, like, like mercs basically and they they did a lot of lot of crazy stuff but they're also rpg guys so yeah, yeah. so when we play we come together once a year uh, we rent a huge villa turn it into uh you know the the, the prancing pony from lord of the rings you know <laughs> and uh, you have these these top military uh, nato guys there uh which are friends of mine and uh, <laughs> yeah and uh, they they are yeah, they're, they're they're tough cookies, you know. Some of them have done also really yeah, had to do horrible things, but they like to play an elf in the forest, and we just come and unwind in a sort of contra PTSD uh, therapy really? with all of us. But yeah, so I, I did train a lot, but I'm not really a military guy because I did not the standard service or anything. But yeah. I know more as a civilian than most people know about <laughs> and the stuff. So I like swords. Yeah. I also like uh, to know how to handle myself that's uh, good. with yeah. contemporary equipment. Mm, that's good. Yeah, we have to be. We have to be fluent, and we have to now learn. You know, learn more skills as we go along. I see that drive and passion to live each moment to the fullest. I think that's very unique. Not many people do that. Some people say, "Oh no, stick to one thing." Uh, I think you've got many talents and you pursue them all. I live my life the same way. And I want to ask you now, as we come to the close of this session, mm -hmm. a final question would be, do you have any words of wisdom for the audience that you want to leave them with before we end off? Ah, yeah, that's always an interesting. And I, and, I, and I always have one. I always have a few. And then when people put me on the spot, I suddenly <laughs> go blank. So that is how it is. It's like, Eh, uh, yeah. Well, mm, hmm, hmm, hmm. Well, generally, I would say that. Uh, well, actually, yeah, that's a good one. But yeah, you have to listen more to your gut. That's basically yeah. what it is. To 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 your yes. gut, because your gut in the end knows 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 everything. And uh, the biggest problem I think nowadays is. Uh, you want to control everything with your with your big brain and it's the slowest processor that you have your neocortex can really do six to eight kilobytes a second it's the slowest machine in the galaxy but your cerebellum and also your gut feeling your responses and your gut you know that that always tells you the truth and uh you you more doors open when you listen to to your gut and uh yeah and trying to control the whole world and your own world with just your brain you know yeah. and overthinking things it becomes like a you know a maze it's like ping pong in your head mm -hmm. you don't get anywhere so and a lot of people then think uh, identify with that and it's very difficult and it requires balls to listen to mm -hmm. your gut but you know yeah. if something doesn't feel right you know then don't do it but if you don't do it ask yourself the question mm -hmm. is it because of fear or is that feeling that you have is based on something else if it's fear then you should do it so mm -hmm. and you have to be very honest you know so a lot of people they saying no to shit coming your way keeps yeah. you in your same spot so i always so say that's my then that would be my advice always say yes unless Love you know that unless you know it's uh there must be a very specific reason why not but if it's based on fear why you want to say no yeah. you should face your fears and just do it because it will lead to a new moment and no always keeps you on the same spot and a yes can potentially bring you further i love that absolute war Baie dankie vir die wonderlijke woorde van advies, Michelle. Dit was een groot eer vir my. <laughs> Alright, nou, uh, ontzettend bedankt. En uh, superleuk dat ik eventjes uh, hier in het programma mocht zijn. Dus. En uh, ik wens jullie een hele fijne dag allemaal. Ik hoop dat jullie me kunnen verstaan. Hè? Die, ja. uh, die, dat Nederlands van mij. En dan uh, ja, wellicht tot de volgende keer. En enjoy your life to the fullest.
There we go. Thank you so much, Michelle. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. And we'll see you on the other side. Ridiculous Moments audience, we'll see you in the next session. Michelle, it's been truly a blessing. Have a beautiful day. Thank you very much. Bye. Ciao, ciao, guys. Hi, my name is Jose Escobar, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Connected Leaders Academy. We're the number one fastest growing community and tribe of some of the highest level entrepreneurs all around the country and around the world. We're in 36 states across the U.S., in 11 international countries, and over 240 plus members growing every single day. And I'm honored, excited, and I'm, I'm glad to say that I'm proud to be the official sponsor of the Meticulous Moments podcast with Juanita Cap. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm excited for this journey. Hey everybody, my name is Patrick Rude. I'm the owner of Rude Financial Services, a proud sponsor of the Meticulous Moments podcast, uh, hosted and directed by the beautiful, strong, and intelligent Juanita Cap. I cannot tell you enough about what this woman has done with this podcast and the effect that she has had on me and all of the other sponsors and people that listen. Don't miss it.